Hi everyone. Today I'd like to walk you through a project in which I use a convolutional neural network along with some computer vision techniques to identify a plant's species using images of seedlings. The motivation here is to achieve more efficient gardening and agriculture. If we identify weeds early on and can distinguish them from the plants we want to grow, we can take action earlier. This task came from the Kaggle competition named Plant Seedling Classification, seen here. I will be using Keras to build and train my model, Matplotlib for visualizations, CV2 for some image pre-processing, and NumPy and Pandas for basic data manipulation. First, I want to get familiar with my data and how it's organized. Within my train directory, I have a folder for each of the 12 species I will be training my model to identify. These folder names will serve as the labels. Within each folder, I have multiple images of seedlings for that species. In my test folder, we have similar images, but with no labels. The output of this project will be a file containing my predictions for each of the images in the test folder. Kaggle provided a sample submission, which looks like the following. In my Jupyter Notebook, I begin by giving a preview of the directory structure. Next, I build a bar chart to show how many samples we have from each class in our training set. We see that there is some degree of class imbalance, which we will want to account for later on. With only a few hundred samples per class, we likely want to use image augmentation to get the most learning out of this data, especially since we will have even fewer samples per class once we split out a validation set from this training set. Next, I display a few random images from each class. Some things I noticed are that we can have pretty dramatic differences in image resolution. Look at this common wheat image. Another thing that stood out to me is the different stages of growth for images within a given class. For instance, these first two scentless mayweed images are clearly more mature than the second two images. This kind of variability may increase the need for a more complex model. I also noticed that the lighting and background is mostly consistent and the plants we want to classify are all green. This could allow for a strategic pre-processing of our images, which can speed up the learning process. Before we go any further, let's create our validation set. I decided to randomly pull 20% of the images from each class in our training set for validation. Again, I show the count per class in each set. These counts are certainly a bit low, but it'll have to do. Now, I will attempt to take advantage of the consistent background and plant colors to remove the backgrounds from our images. Removing the backgrounds will leave our model with fewer distractions and should enable it to learn more quickly. First, I want to get a representative color distribution of our images. I selected 10 random images from each of the 12 classes and selected 50 random pixels from each of those images. I combine these pixels into a single image for analysis. I then plotted these pixels using the RGB basis. We can clearly see which pixels belong to plants and which belong to the background, but it may be difficult to separate these as is. I then tried converting to the HSV basis using the CV2 library and plotted the pixels in that basis. The value dimension does not seem important for separating out the plant pixels from the background pixels, so we can go to two dimensions. From here, I visually choose the upper and lower bounds of hue and saturation to be used to separate out our background. We get lucky here, but if necessary, we could have used a clustering algorithm to find the appropriate boundaries instead. Based on these bounds, I tested out the results of setting all background pixels to black. It looks like this does what we want. It's worth noting that this approach should be used with caution for real-world applications where we might not have the same consistency in background colors. I created a function for this transformation with an output that is compatible with the image data generator from Keras. I then create this image data generator, which will also perform random rotations as well as horizontal and vertical flips on our training images after applying our pre-processing function. The idea here is to change the image over each epoch 
as to create the effect of having more training data than we really do. I set up a training, validation, and testing generator for iterating over the images with a batch size of 20. Luckily, the flow from directory method is perfectly compatible with our directory structure already. Now let's account for class imbalance. I use the inverse frequency of each class and then normalize these values so they have a mean of 1. This dictionary of weights can be fed right into the Keras fit generator once we're ready to train our model. As a sanity check, we saw earlier that the loose silky bent species is the most common class. As expected, we see that it has been assigned the lowest weight, and so each training sample from this class will have a dampened influence when updating our trainable parameters. Now it's time to build our model. I have experimented with several different hyperparameters throughout this project. I've experimented with the number of layers, use of batch normalization, learning rate schedules, I've used various optimizers, different dropout rates, different number of nodes per layer, different activation functions, and I also experimented with varying the training image size. Perhaps I was losing some important information when decreasing the resolution. I tested turning off and on the background removal, and I've even tried using some pre-trained models. I generally found that the models built from scratch actually perform better than the pre-trained models. This could be due to the nature of the data that these pre-trained models were trained on. It could also be due to me trimming off too many or too few of the downstream layers. Given more time, I would have liked to have experimented with more pre-trained networks for this project. I settled on a model which uses four convolutional layers, followed by a densely connected flattened layer. Lastly, I add a 12-node densely connected layer, which uses a softmax activation function to make predictions. I use the ReLU activation function throughout and incorporate dropout in each layer, as well as max pooling in each convolutional layer. Overall, my model has 1.8 million trainable parameters. I define a callback, which will save our model with the lowest validation loss during training. For our optimizer, I chose the Atom algorithm with the AMS grad variation, which is said to have better convergence properties than the regular Atom optimizer. I compile our model using categorical cross entropy as our loss function, which is the standard for multi class classification. With about 3,800 training examples and a training generator which uses a batch size of 20, I set the steps per epoch to 190 and will iterate over 50 epochs. After training, I load the best model and save the training history. I plotted the accuracy and loss during training. We see convergence around 90% accuracy. I then invoke the test generator to make predictions on our test data. Lastly, I use these results to generate a CSV in the format of the sample submission shown earlier. As seen in Kaggle, my submission scored 90% accuracy, which is aligned with our expectations gained from the validation set. Overall, I had a great time working on this project and gained valuable experience playing around with a variety of hyperparameters and computer vision techniques. I do see that one of the highest scoring publicly available notebooks on Kaggle actually used the pre-trained exception model and scored around 98% accuracy. I will definitely want to experiment more with pre-trained models in future projects. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching. I look forward to the next one.